First thing I have to do is I have to test the mental prowess of the audience to which I'm about to speak. Now I know there are some who have already heard this sermon because I see your faces out there, so you are exempt from this test because I don't want you yelling out the answers, George. All right. In what country are Panama hats made? Panama. Somebody said China. I like that answer. <laughs> Correct answer is Ecuador. Oh. What month do the Russians celebrate the October Revolution? August? November. November. Very good. We got one Russian sitting in our midst. Here, I thought you were Norwegian all this time. The Canary Islands in the Pacific are named after what animal? Canaries. Canaries. Eh. It's Latin. Insularia canaria. Canaria from the word we get canine. So it is the island of dogs. Hmm. What color is a purple finch? Purple, no. Red, very good. We got some orthologists here, that's good. Chinese gooseberries, where are they from? Gooseland. Goose <laughs> nice try. New Zealand, of course, right? And uh, how long did the 30 years war last? 130. It lasted 30 years, come on, these are easy. Well, the things that we think we know, sometimes when we discover we don't know them, it's kind of disconcerting. It's like, well, I thought that was, you know, something I had logged in my brain, something I totally understood, and now I discover that I didn't know that as well as I thought I did. Hmm? Our knowledge is limited. However, if we look at Psalm 139, we discover something amazing about our God, a vast difference between our God and ourselves. That in the midst of our, our lack of knowledge, we have a God who has an extreme intimate knowledge. Now the reason that this is really important is I believe that there is, is something really detrimental happening in the church today, and that is our understanding of who God is. In a book written by Lundquist Denton uh, called Soul Searching, he writes this, that today's Christian, especially young adults, have this view of God. They believe that God is a moralistic, therapeutic deism, which means that God is something like a combination of a divine butler and a cosmic therapist. He's always on call, takes care of any problems that arise, professionally helps his people to feel better about themselves, and does not become too personally involved in the process. What that leads to is shallow Christianity, where your view of God is very limited. The activity of God in your life is very shallow. Your expectation of your God is pretty low. Psalm 139, Lord, <clears throat> you have searched me. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. That doesn't sound like a God who is distant. That doesn't sound like a God who is disinterested. That doesn't sound like a God who is not woven into the very fabric of your being. That sounds like a God who is extremely um, active in your life, extremely active in all of creation. What we have is a big church word. We discover the omniscience of God. God has searched me completely. In Hebrews, in uh, the fourth chapter, we hear 
Nothing in all of creation, nothing, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare to him whom we must give account. You know when I sit and when I rise. God knows when I'm sitting on the couch vegetating watching television and God knows when I get up and go out and weed the vegetables in my garden. God knows it all. He knows my activities. He knows my leanings. He knows everything that I'm engaged in in life. Not only that, verse 2 says that God perceives my thoughts from afar. God knows me intimately. There's a medical procedure called an upper gastrointestinal endoscopy, an upper GI. Many of you had that? This is what happens. The doctors take this long tube and they stick it in your mouth and it goes down to the back of your throat, goes down into your esophagus, continues on down, continues on down into your stomach, into your duodenum. I can never pronounce I always look at Lori because she's my expert nurse that tells me if I'm pronouncing it correctly continues on down until the top of your small intestine. And then they put a camera on that thing so they can take pictures. Inside, right here, past your stomach, they're taking pictures of you. Isn't that amazing? It's incredible. And yet, God knows you even more intimately than an upper GI. God knows you at the cellular and molecular level. He knows every single atom contained in you. He knows it intimately. Not only that, God knows all of your thoughts. God knows your thoughts as they are forming. And he knows them from afar. Now, <clears throat> this gets me all worked up. Because... Not only got to know my thoughts, but then the things that flow out of my thoughts, like my, my actions and my words. And it says in verse 4, before a word is formed on my tongue, you know it completely, O God. Before I speak, God doesn't have to wait until I speak a word to know what I'm going to speak. He doesn't even have to wait while it's forming. He knows as it's forming, before it's even formed on my lips, God knows this. The thing I get worked up about is, I say some pretty dumb things. Sometimes I try to be funny and end up just saying the most stupid thing in the face of the earth and I go, man, as soon as it comes out of my mouth, I go, why in the world did I say that? That's not what I meant. That's not what I wanted to say. So I wish that God, with his omniscience, would help me out a little bit. That God knows when I'm going to say something dumb and so he can, he can you know, like send me an email and say, Kip Tyler, uh, Saturday on July 29th, you're going to say something really dumb at 4.53 p.m. So don't talk. When you get there, just don't, I mean, use duct tape, whatever it takes to keep you from talking because it's just going to happen, right? But I don't get those emails. I thought for sure this last week after preaching this sermon East Campus, I would get one of those emails and it would come from George, signed, God, you know, Tyler, shut your mouth. Doesn't work that way. But our God has this incredible foreknowledge. This is incredible. This is more than surface. Verse 6, Lucy translated, King David says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too lofty for me to comprehend. How can you grasp a God who knows your every thought, who knows you from a molecular level, who knows you as you're being formed in your mother's womb, who knows your thoughts? How, how can you possibly Grab a hold of a God like that because God is not only knowing you that intimately, but God knows all the other billions of people that intimately at the same time. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us why this is important. 
No temptation has seized you except that which is common to all people. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I think one of the ways out of temptation is by God revealing this nature, this characteristic of himself in Psalm 139, where he knows you intimately, he knows your thoughts, he knows your words, he knows your actions, he knows your getting up and going out, he knows all this stuff. There is something inherent in the human condition that when we know that we're being watched, we behave ourselves. Huh? My father and I, Law and I, we were coming back from Grand Island yesterday, driving along the interstate, and I can tell you that every time I saw a state patrolman with his lights going, every time I saw a state patrolman sitting in the median, every time I saw a state patrolman with that radar gun pointed at me, I did not speed up. As a matter of fact, I slowed down. When Grandma's around, do you just decide, well, I can do whatever I want, say whatever I want. No, Grandma's around, so you clean it up a little bit, right? Well, think about this. Your God, the creator of all, is with you 24-7. He knows you intimately. He knows your thoughts. He knows your words. He knows your actions, your deeds. He can see it from afar. He's always close up. Our God is with us all the time. And if that is a reality, if we come to understand that, don't you think that might give us an out in temptation? To say, wow, I don't want to sin in the presence of God, and he is right here right now. The fact is, we mess up. fact is, we rebel. The fact is, we yield to temptation even in the face of our God, even when we know he's watching. But what we also learn about God in this psalm is that he is continually with us and is interested in us. You hem me in, behind and before. You lay your hand upon me, and such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? When I sin, where can I hide? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and light become night around me, even the darkness is not darkness to you. The night will shine on like the day because darkness is as light to you. Darkness hides nothing from God. What we're talking about here is another big church word about God. Omnipresence. Omni meaning everywhere, presence, locale. God is located everywhere at the same time. This doesn't mean pantheism where God is 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 in, trapped in something, but God is, is present everywhere at the same time. Do you comprehend this? Do, do you grab a hold of this? God is everywhere at the same time. Got it? Do you realize that the nearest star, not counting our sun, but the nearest star to earth is 4.24 light years away. Now how fast is light? Right? I mean, way faster than that, right? I mean, light's really, really fast. It takes light 4.24 years to get from that star to us. That's a long ways, guys. That's a really long ways, and yet God is there and here at the same time. Now, 
We talk about being stretched thin, right? God's not stretched thin. He is fully present there and here at the exact same moment. I can't even be at both campuses at the same time. I try, I want to be, but I can't. I can't do it. It's just not within me. And yet my God is one who can. I find that absolutely extraordinary. And you know what? That's the nearest star. There are other stars out there that the Hubble telescope has seen that say it takes 70,000 years for light to get from there to here. And our God is present there and here at the same time. That is amazing. God is supernatural outside of the laws of nature. And therefore we are unable in our experience to grasp the immensity of our God. Colossians 1.16 For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, and in him all things are held together. What does that mean? It means that God couldn't get any closer to you than he is right now. Because he's everywhere. But people throughout history have asked this profound question. You may have asked it. I have asked it. Where's God? Where is God? When you're depressed and and struggling with, with brokenness, you say, where is God? When you're struggling with faith and God doesn't seem to be anywhere around, you say, where is God? You have something absolutely catastrophic happen to you and your family. It doesn't make any sense and you're hurt, you're bitter, you're angry. You say, where is God? The answer is, God is there. In that presence. Always. Now how do we make sense of this? I can still remember the emotional reaction I had as a kid. I was at home. I was playing with my marbles. I used to have different colored marbles, like hundreds of them, and I'd play cowboys and Indians with marbles. And, you know, I had played Custer's last stand on the carpet, I don't know how many times. So I'm playing with my marbles, pushing them around. And I look up, and the house is quiet. Mom! Silence. Dad? Nothing. And so I started going room to room, looking. There's nobody there. There's, there's lights turned off. It's dark in some of those rooms. And I'm like, what's going on? Where, where are they? I've been abandoned. I'm alone. Ah! And all of a sudden, there began to materialize monsters behind doors, just wetting to, for me to walk by and they can grab me and suck my flesh right off my bones, right? Then I started pondering, I don't know how to make any food, and I don't know what foods, I'm going to starve to, I'm going to, I'm going to die. Dad, Mom, help! Then I heard the lawnmower start up in the backyard. And I went and looked out the window. There's my dad mowing the lawn. I was never alone. I was never abandoned. But my mind believed I was and knew that I was going to reach my demise really soon. And yet, the truth was, no one had left me alone. I can say this with complete confidence. If you're here this morning and your heart's breaking, and you say, where's God? I, can, with complete confidence, can say God is with you. You may not sense it. You may not believe it. You may not find it tangible. But God is with you. Intimately. Lonely, God is with you. In pain, God is with you. Struggling, God is with you. So 
Psalm 34. The Lord is near to those who are discouraged. He saves those who have lost all hope. Verse 10, he says, Your hand will guide me. Your right hand will keep me fast. God is guiding us. God uh, has life figured out for us. Verses 13, You have created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Here's the point. God created you exactly the way he wanted you to be created. It was a part of his perfect plan for you. He wanted you to look just like you look. He wanted you to have the exact skills and abilities and talents that you have. It was his perfect design for you. Now here's my question. How many of you, when you stand in front of the mirror and stare into that mirror, go, God, wonderful job you did on me. Yeah, we don't, do we? We go, oh boy, God, come on. You could have done better than this. Right? And yet, when we do that, who are we critiquing? Ourselves or our God? The psalmist says, I was fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves you just the way you are. Yeah, I may look at myself and go, man, i got to lose weight and I take responsibility for that. But God has, has woven us together in a wonderful way. He made us all uniquely different. I look over this gathered congregation and there's not one of you that look alike. Even the twins look a little bit different, don't they, Sue? Yeah. Fearfully and wonderfully made by our God. And because of that, our God has a plan for you. He has a will for you, a purpose for you. He, he created you the way he wanted you to be so that you could fulfill the purpose that he created you for. So maybe we should spend time saying, God, I open myself in humility to find out just exactly what it is that you want of me, what you have designed me to be, you who, who have known me from the very beginning, the one who have crafted me in my mother's womb, the one who knows me at a cellular level, the one who knows my thoughts and my words before they're thought and spoken. What do you want, God? You see, this aspect of humility is absolutely critical. We humble ourselves in the presence of our God, and when we do that, we discover some profound truths about our God and about ourselves. And life suddenly has meaning and purpose that go way beyond anything that we could ever expect. We need to stop being self-critical putting ourselves down. And we need to start lifting up God, honoring God, and recognizing what God has done for us. Verse 13, David says, For you created my inmost being, my core. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I praise you. Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now here's the great truth. <clears throat> Our God can be everywhere at the same time. We can't. Our God knows everything about us. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And we can't. One of my favorite movies is the movie Rudy. About this little shrimp of a guy who just has this intense desire to play football for Notre Dame University and they just beat the daylights out of this kid but he's determined <clears throat> in the end he finally gets to play but in the midst of his chaos in the midst of trying to figure out if this is you know really a, a good calling he he has befriended Father Kavanaugh who's on the staff at Notre Dame and and asks him for spiritual guidance 
And I, Father Kavanaugh's line was great. He said, in 37 years of theological reflection, I have come to two great truths. One, there is a God. And second, I'm not him. We need to live in that type of humility. My challenge for you this week is to ponder the presence of God. To just sit and reflect upon this psalm and, and realize the vastness of our God. And if you don't feel God's presence, still live in the reality God's presence. Even if you don't understand everything in Psalm 139, know that the God is there. That even if you don't believe it, realize this. It doesn't take your belief to make God real. God is present. His presence drives us to humility protects us from temptation, bonds us to each other, makes us recognize the glory of his creation called us. His presence is what drives us to the feet of Jesus to learn his truth and his promise for us. In his holy and precious name, Amen.